You are listening to Nehemiah, Building a City Within the City. In this series, Pastor Michael opens the book of Nehemiah and looks at the importance of the church in the context of the city. For more audio and video resources, visit visionchurch.me. Uh, like I said, you guys saw that video about overcoming opposition. How many of you guys have ever faced opposition in your life before? Yeah, that's what I thought. Pretty much all of us. And some of us right now, if we're honest with ourselves, we might even say, well, Chris, you know, you know, right now, I, I, I'm facing opposition right now in my life. And to be honest, I have no idea how to overcome it. I just don't know what to do. I've prayed. I've talked to people. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to overcome it. And some of us might say, if we're honest, well, you know what? My life right now seems to be pretty, pretty steady, pretty good. You know, just came through something a few months ago. Everything seems to be going good right now. You know, I think I'm good. And, and that's great. If you're in that place, that's a blessing from God. It's because that you're in that season season where you can just glorify him and then when you're in the season of going through an opposition we get to glorify him even more because he's the god in the desert and he's the, and he's the god in in your good times as well as your bad times and so this morning i want to go over with you guys three key points um and one of those is how to overcome opposition and i just want to kind of give you guys some little nuggets that you can put in your pockets and kind of take with you and, and learn from what you guys have been studying in the book of nehemiah and if you're with us and today is your first time we're on actually part three today on Nehemiah. Um, so we, we haven't gone very far in the book. It's only still in the first chapter, in the first, second chapter here. And there's a lot of really good examples that Nehemiah does in his life that we can follow after. And so today, I, I just want to take some of those and I want to encourage you guys about those. Um, so... In case, again, you haven't been here the past two weeks, or if you're um, like me and you've slept since last Sunday and you really can't remember what happened last week, I'm going to give you guys kind of a recap. So if you have your Bibles, why don't you go ahead and turn to the book of Nehemiah, and we're going to be in chapter 2, Nehemiah chapter 2, and we're going to start in verse 11. So if you've got your tablets, your smartphones, or your, your actual Bibles, whichever one works, and if you don't have either or, we got it on this amazing jumbotron of a screen here. Um, you don't really even need glasses to see it because it's so huge. So, um, but uh, so it's Nehemiah chapter two, and uh, like I said, I'm going to give you guys a quick recap of what's going on here as you guys turn to Nehemiah chapter two. So to bring you guys up to speed, Nehemiah is this normal guy. He's a normal guy just like you and me, except his job instead of working at a Kroger or a Sonic or um, a building in downtown Dallas, he is in his story. He is a cupbearer to the king. Not necessarily a job I would want to have is because Nehemiah's job is to test the wine to make sure that it's not poison before the king drinks it. Not a job I'd want to have. I don't know about you. So to bring you guys also up to speed on what's been going on so far is that Nehemiah found out, it's not new news, but he found out that the walls of Jerusalem are still broken down and the city of Jerusalem is still a complete disgrace. He's a Jew. That's his home city. And he's finding this out again that, you know, it's been like this for over a hundred years and he starts crying. The Bible says in Nehemiah chapter one that he literally goes throughout this prayer and this fasting time, which Pastor Michael let you guys know is about three or four months of prayer and fasting. And then what? God answered his prayer. God granted him favor through the king and the king granted uh, Nehemiah, his own cupbearer, to go to fix the walls of the city. Again, he's not a carpenter. He's not a construction worker. He's a cupbearer. So he has no knowledge of any of this stuff, but the king grants him favor to go do this, and this is the same king that saw the destruction of these walls not too long ago. Talk about God's favor. And so he allows him to go, but he doesn't just allow him to go. He allows him, he, he gives him the passports and all the paperwork he needs to get there to prove that the king is sending him so that no one will stop him. And not only that, but the king also provides Nehemiah with all the wood he needs to build the 12 gates of Jerusalem. And not only that, the king also provides Nehemiah with a royal escort. He provides them with the captains of his personal army and horsemen to take him there. Talk about God's blessings. And so we're actually going to start here in chapter 2, verse 11. And in chapter 2, verse 10, it says that there's these two guys, and I want you guys to take special note of these because we're going to come back to these guys. There's a guy named Sanballat and Tobiah. And uh, these guys are kind of, I want to think they are the villains of our story here. Uh, they, it says in verse 10 that uh, when they saw that someone was coming to seek the well-being of Jerusalem, they started to get really upset. So I kind of just imagine maybe like a movie picture, maybe a screen, because you got one up here. We're in a movie theater. Why not? And you imagine you see off in the distance these, um, these two villains are standing on a cliff, and off in the distance they're seeing this guy, and they've gotten word that he's going to Jerusalem to seek the well-being of it. And they 
they start getting upset and they decide that they're going to start planning a scheme to make sure that he fails. And so we're going to pick up the story right here in verse 11 of chapter 2. And it says, So I came to Jerusalem and was there three days. Then arose in the night and I saw a few men with me and I told no one what God had put in my heart to do to Jerusalem, nor was there any animal with me except the one which I rode. And I went out by night through the valley gate to the serpent well and to the refuse gate and viewed the walls of Jerusalem which were broken down and its gates which were burned with fire. Then I went on to the fountain gate and to the king's pool, but there was no room for the animal that was under me to pass. So I went up in the night by the valley and viewed the wall. Then I turned back and entered by the valley gate and I so returned. And the officials did not know where I had gone or what I had done. I had not yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials or the others who would do the work. I want to give you guys another quick recap just to show you where we have come. If you guys were with us last week, Pastor Michael taught about prayer and action. And the cool thing about that is that the main point Pastor Michael was trying to get across last week was that, you know, it says that you need to have God change the way you see things, change the way you view things. Because sometimes we, we see things completely differently the way God sees them. And so Pastor Michael was encouraging all of us from the story of Nehemiah to change the way, um, to have God change the way we view things. And then what? To follow it up with prayer. But not just a little dinky prayer of, now I lay me down to sleep kind of a prayer. But a prayer that has an intent of taking some action to it. Um, there's a scripture in Matthew chapter 5 verse 14. And Jesus himself said this. He said, a city set on a hill cannot be hidden. The whole premise of this series of Nehemiah that Pastor Michael is trying to share with us is that It's building a city within a city. And what that means for us today is that it's building a city, which is the church, within our actual city. In this case, it's the DFW Metroplex. And Jesus is telling us to let our light shine. And he's commanding us. It's an action. Shining your light. It's an action to do. And he's commanding us to go, to do, to accomplish. I'm sorry, to accomplish these things. And so Jesus is telling us to do these things. And so here we're seeing Nehemiah doing just that. He's letting his light shine. He's letting his light shine by obeying God. And so we're going to pick it up here. I want to also share share with you guys really quick, just in these few verses alone that we talked about, that we can learn something really important from Nehemiah. And that's we as leaders need to, we need to learn a sense of God's timing. We need to learn a sense of God's timing. And you might be saying to yourself, well, Chris, I guess that rules me out because I'm not a leader. I'm not a leader. But I want to stop your thinking right there because you guys are leaders. We are all leaders of Christ because you become a leader of Christ the moment you ask Jesus into your heart. You become a leader of Christ the moment you give your life over to God and say, God, it's not my life anymore. Forgive me of my sins. I want to live a life after you. You remember the verse that that was kind of up here, I guess, in Matthew, that a city set on a hill cannot be hidden? Okay, the few verses right after that, in verses 15 and 16, Jesus says this. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. I don't know if you guys noticed this, um, kind of stating the obvious here, but in order for a city to be lit up, it starts by turning on a single light bulb. And then another one, and then another one, and another one. And then before you know it, you have this city lit up with brilliant light. Or back in the Bible times, they're lighting candles or turning on lamps. So it's up to us. I believe that's what Jesus was trying to get across to us, is that we each have a part to play in his kingdom. We each have a part to play to go and do and shine our light in order for our city that's within our actual city to be lit up. Because if we don't have our light shining... It's like we're hiding it under a basket, and Jesus was telling us not to do that. Um, This is something I tell the kids in kids' church when we're talking about this amazing gift of salvation. You know, we talk to them about how God sent his only son into this world to die on the cross for us, to literally bridge the gap between a holy being, a holy God, and a sinful human being. And Jesus came and died on the cross just for us so that we could have that doorway open to have a personal relationship with this holy God. And we talk about this gift of salvation in kids' church, and I tell the kids this all the time. As Christians, with this amazing gift inside of us, how dare we hold it inside of us? I mean, literally, how dare we hold this inside of us and not tell our peers because we're scared what others might think? Or how dare we hold it inside of us when something in our world goes crazy and we don't say anything because we're afraid we're going to be labeled as hate speech? 
How dare we? See, we need to let our light shine. And again, you guys are all leaders. If you're a husband, you're a leader over your wife. If, you're, if you guys have kids, wife and husband, you're a leader over your kids. You're a leader over your coworkers and over your employers. You're a leader over your friends and over your family. People are watching you all the time, and you are a leader regardless if you have a leadership position or not in this world that they label you as. We are all leaders of Christ. So with that being said, I want, to, I want you guys to keep in mind that this whole I'm a leader because that's what we're learning from Nehemiah here. And so we're going to continue on in what he has. And another thing I want you guys to realize about what Nehemiah did is that when he got there to Jerusalem, and said that he was there three days and he didn't do anything. He didn't tell anyone, anybody, what he was there to do and this burden that God placed on his heart. See, I kind of think the reason why he was doing that is because it sets a good example for us is because he didn't jump in and try to become Mr. Fix-It. He didn't jump in trying to do it all on his own. This is another thing that we can learn. Like I said, we need to learn a sense of God's timing, and that's exactly what Nehemiah knew. He knew to wait on God. He knew that he wasn't just supposed to arrive and become everyone's hero. Because I think, I truly believe that while he was walking those walls of Jerusalem at nighttime, I don't know if you guys are paying attention, but he said he went out of the valley gate, walked all the way around to all these other gates and all these other places, but then he re-entered into the valley gate. He literally walked the entire wall. I think what he was probably thinking about was... Maybe he was counting the cost. Maybe he was thinking, you know, how much is this going to cost us with money, with labor, with time, with talent, with leadership? What does this look like? So he was counting the cost before he jumped into it. But another thing, another thing I think that he was doing was that as he was viewing and examining those walls, he was seeing the extent of the damage, seeing how much it was going to take. Um, the New King James Version says that he viewed the walls. And so I looked up, I'm not a Greek philosopher or a Hebrew philosopher, but I have a strong concordance. And so I looked up that word viewed in the New King James Version, and it carries um, the word in Hebrew, again, I don't even know if I'm pronouncing this right, but it's called Shabar. And it carries the meaning of to wait with patience and hope. So he's viewing the walls of Jerusalem, waiting on God's perfect timing with hope. And that's what we need to do. We need to wait on God's perfect timing with hope. Another definition of that is like a doctor. It gives this awesome description of like a doctor that probes a wound to see how much of the extent of the damage is, has been done. And that's possibly what Nehemiah has, was doing. See, the reason why I think also he didn't just jump in and try to fix it on his own and try to tell everyone, it's because he was probably going to be seen as a critic. He was probably going to be seen as someone who brings despair on everybody because he's jumping in trying to tell everyone all all of a sudden what they need to do but he didn't do that i want you guys to ask yourself this question really quick because we're talking about a broken down wall but uh ask yourself this question if someone took a took a tour of your life namely the holy spirit but if someone took a tour of your life right now like nehemiah took a tour of the walls of jerusalem would they find some broken down figurative walls in your life right now and the book of Proverbs, chapter 25, 28 says, Whoever has no rule over his own spirit is like a city broken down without walls. Is like a city broken down without walls. The uh, NIV says that whoever has no self-control over his life is like a city broken down without walls. Why does it say you're like a city broken down without walls? Well, that's exactly what we're talking about here in Nehemiah. Um, Jerusalem's walls have been broken down. And what that means for that city is that it's a complete disgrace. It was considered to be a disgrace if your walls of your city were completely torn down. And we want to make sure that the walls in our lives are built up. Why? Because we have God with us. Because we have God with us. See, we know Nehemiah had the heart and he had the vision to see this plan through. But he also knew that it had to be God's perfect timing. And in order for that vision to become a reality... He had to wait on God with hope. He had, to, he had to rely on God to make sure that this was going to happen in his way and his timing. He had to count the cost before he had to do that. So let's pick up here in Nehemiah chapter 2. This is going to be verse 17 that we're in now. And it says right here, Then I said to them, Now again, imagine, okay, these three days he didn't do anything. And then, so at nighttime he gets out with a few guys and walks the entire gates of Jerusalem. I'm thinking maybe this is maybe morning time. And he's gathering everyone together. And this is when he says, Then I said to them, the people of Jerusalem, you see the distress that we're in and how Jerusalem lies waste and its gates are burned with fire. Come and let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer be a reproach. Some versions say a disgrace. And I told them of the hand of my God, which had been good to me and also of the king's words that he had spoken to me. And so they said, let us rise up and build. And then they set their hands to this good work. 
See, as a leader of Christ, I believe the second key we can take from this part of Nehemiah's story is this, that we need to lead with vision. To lead with vision. Because I really, I really think that Nehemiah went into this with full prayer, with full dependence on God. Because how would you perceive it if you were in uh, Nehemiah's shoes. You are a Jew. You're from Jerusalem, but you don't live in that city because you're off serving a king somewhere else. And all of a sudden you come in and you know that you know that you know that you know that God has given you the passion and the desire and the vision to fix this wall that is all the way around. How would that affect you? Because you having to walk in and tell these people, um, your people, how to build this wall I don't know if it would go very well. And Nehemiah kind of knew that. So he was kind of waiting on God's timing. Um, Nehemiah has a lot of wisdom in how he approaches these people of Jerusalem. And a few things that we can take from that is this, is that wisely Nehemiah stated the obvious to them, and he owned the problem himself. It says that you see the distress that we are in. See, he, he approaches them, and sometimes we have to admit that the obvious is the hardest to see in our lives sometimes. We see a problem, and sometimes it's it, we see it, and we're like, yeah, but that's not really it. But it is. The obvious is sometimes the hardest to see. And in all probability, I think the Jews were probably at this point in their lives. Again, the walls have been broken down for over 100 years. And they have probably seen it as a task that's too big to overcome. They probably have seen it as something that there's no way. Someone tried to rebuild it before, and they failed. So I think that in all probability, they just were content in living with their walls being torn down. And I hope that we never come to a point in our lives to where we're content with having some of our walls in our lives just broken down. Because that's a disgrace. In our spiritual lives, we need to make sure that we have everything built up on the solid foundation of God's Word. Another thing, like I said, Nehemiah not only stated the obvious, but... He also owned the problem. If you read it with an emphasis, he says, you see the distress we are in. He didn't say you were in. He said we are in. So he owned the problem as his own. Why? A, because he was a Jew. That was his city. But B, again, he didn't want to come in saying, you see the distress you are in and point fingers and all of a sudden become the critic. They wouldn't receive him. Instead, he owned the problem himself. Here's another thing that Nehemiah did wisely. He asked for their partnership and he encouraged them in the Lord and what God had already done for him. So this is kind of one of my favorite parts of the story is that I can just imagine Nehemiah standing up and telling everybody, you guys don't understand. God has given me this vision. It's amazing. And this is what's going to happen. And just to let you know that this is all God's project. It's not my project. You know, I was over there and I was serving King and he was telling me this and I was like, no, I'm sad. And he's telling me all this stuff. And so I tell him, and then he goes into description of what the King did for him and how he, he gave him grace and favor to go off and provided him paperwork and provided him the lumber and provided him this. And I really think inside of the people, they started to get excited because they started to see that this was God orchestrating this from the beginning. And that's one thing that we need to learn as leaders is that if you're ever needing to um, ask people for help, which is kind of one of the models that Nehemiah gives here, is that sometimes we just need to swallow our pride and ask people to rally around us and pray with us and help us, because sometimes our problem is too big for one person to do it alone. Um, one of the things is that uh, we just need to ask for help. We just need to ask them to rally with us and pray with us. And that's one of the cool things that he did, is that he ensured them that it wasn't his project, it was God's project. And again, I think the people were really getting excited, because as Nehemiah is explaining how God is just moving, he says that he explained how his the hand of his God was upon him and how it was good to him and what the king spoke to them. I really think they started to see the fingerprints of God through this whole ordeal. Because when people start seeing the fingerprints of God to help make a vision come into a reality, they get excited about it. Because they realize something bigger at work is here. But when they don't see God's fingerprints, when they see that this vision and this thing is only to build you up, they don't want anything to do with it. And they started to see that this was God. He ensured them that it was God's project, not his own project. And Nehemiah knew that he couldn't do this alone. He knew that this was one job that was just going to be too big to do on his own. And so he had to ask for help. So here's something that Nehemiah didn't do, something that we can learn, is that he didn't criticize them. He didn't um, offer them bribes and pay and vacation times or anything like that in order to help them work. Um, He allowed God to create an inward motivation in their hearts. An inward motivation. 
Again, I think it's because they were starting to see the fingerprints of God through all of this. Because he could have used outward motivation. He could have guilt-tripped them. He could have used pressure. He could have forced them to. And that might have worked for a little while. But it wouldn't have finished the work. And it wouldn't have been done right. And in the end, to let you know, that's not how God works. So he also, one of the cool things, he never even stopped thinking and treating his job and his mission as a high calling from God. He knew that this was what he was supposed to do. And he never once um, threw it aside and said that that's not what he was going to do. He knew that this was what he was supposed to do. And here's another cool thing in that scripture is that they caught the vision. As we as leaders lead with vision, um, when someone catches the vision that you're trying to cast out there, in it in it of itself, it's an amazing thing if they catch it. Uh, I don't know if you guys see the response there, but they said, let us rise up and build. And then they set their hands to this good work. That's amazing. Because... Like I said, if people see that it's all about you, they're not going to want anything to do with it. But when they see it's all about God, they're excited. And I really believe that they started to get this um, excitement inside of them that they were just all like, let's do it! You know, for Narnia, I don't know. But they were getting really excited, and they were ready to do this for the work of God. They knew that God was beautifully orchestrating this. You know, I kind of have a similar story is that as a children's pastor, I've been on staff with the church and with Pastor Michael for two years now. Time flies when you're having fun. Um, and talking to the kids about worship and talking to the kids about God is amazing. Those kids, y'all's kids are amazing. I don't even know if y'all truly realize it. Their hearts are so huge. Gosh, it's amazing. But um, I never went to Bible college to be a children's pastor. I actually went to Bible college to be a worship leader, like what my wife and the worship team was doing up here. I That's what I was ready to do. I thought that was my calling, but yet every single time I would be done leading worship, no matter where I was at, I'd always find myself with the kids. I don't know why. I would always find myself with the kids, praying with them, worshiping with them, playing with them, teaching them God's word, and long story short, you know, the position opened for me to be a children's pastor, and I cannot imagine me doing anything else ever in my lifetime. I'm going to be 60 years old in a wheelchair maybe, and or 80 maybe, and I'm going to be a children's pastor because it is so much fun. They keep me really, really young. So I'm, I'm young already, but they keep me even younger. So, but God gave me a vision for the kids' ministry. Again, I've never been in uh, seminars for children's ministry or anything like that. And he wanted me to encourage the kids that it's fun to come to church and worship God. It's fun. And not saying that it wasn't beforehand, but one of the things, the very first things I remember asking Pastor Michael, I was like, Pastor Michael, Pastor Michael, um, would it be cool if uh, I created hand motions for worship songs and the kids would, you know, do them? And he looked at me like, are you serious? That is the most cheesiest thing in the entire world. But he gave me permission and we did it and the kids eat it up. The kids love it because they They've got so much energy. They can't just stand there and not do anything. And so doing all these crazy hand motions, they love getting involved. And, and so Pastor Michael makes fun, of me, makes fun of me about it sometimes. But it's so much fun. And then it didn't stop there. Uh, the Lord told me to start doing some prayer and some research about how to incorporate worship into all the other classrooms, including newborn babies in the nursery. And the first thing that came to my mind was, what? Newborn babies worshiping Jesus, what? But then God instantly reminded me of the scripture that his word's not going to return into him void. We might think that the kids can't intellectually receive it, but their spirits do. Their spirits do like crazy. It's like when we wrap up this, um, this is a crazy metaphor for you right here, wrap up uh, this awesome spiritual ball of worship and for these kids to know God and we chunk it at them, that thing's not going to return to us. They're going to catch it and they're going to receive it and they're going to hold on to it for the rest of their lives. And so for a year and a half now, from the nursery all the way up to the elementary, we have a curriculum for them. Even in the nursery. And they have worship. They play instruments. They go crazy beating these plastic drums. I I can't believe they haven't broken yet. But they go crazy on them. And, you know, when babies like stuff, they just stick it in their mouth. So they're worshiping Jesus by sucking on tambourines and stuff like that. And it's awesome. Because to see these kids get up and just dance to these songs for God. And um, they also have this little curriculum that they teach even the nursery babies by praying over them. Showing them God's word. Letting them know this is God's word. This is the Bible. Let's find Jesus. And they open it up and they 
find a picture that we placed of Jesus inside of there. And a year and a half later, I'm hearing teachers and I'm hearing parents tell me, this is amazing. And I'm like, what's amazing? They're like, the kids that are coming from the nursery and they're going into the toddlers and they're going into the preschool, they know who Jesus is. They know what the Bible is. They know what it means to worship God. They know this. And I'm like, I know, isn't it amazing? That's why we're here. And But to let you guys know, we're not stopping here. There's so much more that we can do as a kids ministry and that's what we're going to do. Same thing with Vision Church. Leading up to this, God has been beautifully orchestrating all of this. His fingerprints have been on it. He knew exactly what was going to happen, even the founding of New Life Church. He knew that we were going to be here. And just to let you guys know, this isn't where we're stopping either. We're getting way more awesome equipment, but then this isn't our ultimate location. We've got so much more. A vision that God has given Pastor Michael and Heather. And when they were casting that out to everybody, for us to receive that and not just receive it, but own it as our own, like these people in Jerusalem did. And all of a sudden they rise up and they're like, yes, let's do it. That's exactly what it's like. And it's an amazing feeling knowing that I, this is where I'm supposed to be. This is, this is exactly what I'm supposed to be doing with my life right now because this feels right. It doesn't just feel right, but I know it's right in my heart. And so one of the other things I want to talk to you guys about is this overcoming opposition. This is the third key we can take from Nehemiah's story is how we can overcome opposition. Again, this is kind of a little nugget for you guys to put in your uh, to put in your pockets, to put in your hearts, to put in your minds because this isn't something that necessarily will cure everything in your life, okay? This is something that we can take and learn from. Let's uh let's jump into uh verse 19 and 20 of Nehemiah. We're going to wrap it up with this. Um you guys remember those two villains, San Sanballat and Tobiah? Well, they're back. And they're here. And it says right here in verse 19, But when Sanballat the Hornite, Tobiah the Ammonite official, and Geshem the Arab, so they went and got their Arab friend, Geshem the Arab heard of it. They laughed us to scorn and despised us, and they said this, What is this thing that you're doing? Will you rebel against the king? So I answered and said to them, The God of heaven himself will prosper us. Therefore, we his servants will arise and build. But you have no heritage or right or memorial in Jerusalem. Again, the third key we can take from this part of Nehemiah's story is how to overcome opposition. You might be saying, what? Overcome opposition? This is kind of one of the cool things because I want you guys to notice when the opposition came. When these guys, I seriously think they were villains in training. Because again, at the beginning, they were seeing this guy come and they started scheming a plan to make him fail. This is their big plan. I think it was an epic fail for them because their plan was not to lay a finger on Nehemiah, not to kill him, not to hurt him, not to even tear down the walls that they were going to build up again, not to hurt the people that were going to do it. Their amazing plan was to laugh at him. Everyone point and laugh. (laughs) What a great plan. (laughs) Seriously, they need to go back into training for villains because... Um, But I want you guys to notice something really quick. The opposition that arose against Nehemiah, notice when it came. It didn't come in his prayer stage. It didn't come in his um, fasting stage. It didn't come in when he was asking the king stage, because the king could have said no. It didn't come when Nehemiah finally arrived. Opposition arose when progress started happening. Is it just me or in our lives when God tells us to do something, the enemy is going to say anything and do anything he can to make sure that we fail? That's when opposition arises in our lifetime. And in case, like I said, that opposition wasn't a very big thing. They, again, weren't attacking anything. They weren't attacking anyone. They're using laughter and mockery and anything like that. And I seriously, that is, they need to go back to training on that. But um, one of the things that we need to remember here is that sometimes God will test a resolve by using critics. Sometimes God will test our resolve by using critics. Um, One of the biggest lies we tell kids these days, which has been around for generations to come, and it's that sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. You guys know it. You've probably even said it to your kids or your grandkids before, but that is one of the biggest lies we can tell our kids. The first half of that's true. Yeah, if someone throws a stick at you hard enough, it might break your bone or a stone. Yeah, that's definitely going to hurt. But words never hurt you? That's lies. Because words can and words do hurt. And that was the scheme. That was the plan of these villains of our story is that they were just going to attack Nehemiah with words. And when the devil throws things your way, the question is when he starts throwing these threats your way in your lifetime, you got to ask yourself, am I going to stand firm on what God told me I'm supposed to be doing or am I going to cave in? 
Am I going to stand firm on God's promises or am I going to cave in? See, the devil, man, he loves to throw threats our way. He loves to play with our minds. Um, And I wrote down just maybe three examples of what those might have been. It's numerous. The enemy has an innumerable arsenal of words that he throws at us each and every day. Here's just a few examples that I wrote down. He could say to you, you know what, you're no good, and life is unfair. Apparently God must hate you, so go ahead, take your life. No one's going to miss you. That's just one. Here's another one. He might even say that, you know what, you're never ever going to get out of debt, so just stop trying. Maybe another one that you might have even heard this yourself, but the enemy loves to play this with our minds too because he loves to play with our minds. He loves to play with us by using words um, about our appearances. And you might have heard this. You're everything but beautiful. No one's ever going to want you. See, these are the things. This is exactly why in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, the Bible describes our enemy, the devil, as a roaring lion who seeks someone whom he may devour. But you guys got to look closely. Talking about someone whose bark is worse than his bite, just like our villains in our story here. If you look closely at this lion, he's a feeble, old, skinny lion with no teeth. Our enemy is nothing but a fake. He loves to act tougher than what he is. But don't let that fool you. It's because our enemy is a master with words. He's a master with trickery and deception and lies. Don't let his looks fool you guys. So how did Nehemiah overcome his opposition? We got to the point of, okay, we're going to overcome opposition. So how do we do that? What do we do? I got something going on. What are we going to do? No. Now you're going to learn how to overcome the opposition from what Nehemiah did. Again, his, his oppression that came against him wasn't someone attacking him in the parking lot. It wasn't anything like that. It, or, or you might be facing debt or some crazy thing in your life right now. But it was, it was words that were being spoken to him. And this is how Nehemiah responded to that. And I like this. He ignored what they were saying by not letting them get the last word in. They said what they needed to say, and Nehemiah completely ignored it and jumped right on in, not letting them get the last word in. And he didn't just say, stop it, you guys, you're hurting my feelings. He didn't say that to get the last word in. I know you are, but what am I? He didn't say anything like that. No, he proclaimed his trust and his belief in God. And he told them, and that's how we can overcome opposition in our life, by proclaiming our confidence in God. See, um, go back into your childhood um, about learning about David and Goliath. David faced a similar opposition in his life with Goliath. He could have allowed Goliath to stomp all over him with his words by continually telling him how big he was and how strong he was and how tiny David was compared to him. And David could have listened to him um, say all the more um, bad things about the living God. But David didn't do that. David stepped up and said, because I have my God with me, and because my God is with me, I'm going to kill you. I'm not just going to kill you, but I'm going to cut off your head. That's awesome. See, a little shepherd boy took out a giant Philistine soldier who is like ten times his size. And this is something that we can take away. If you guys hear anything I'm saying today, that out of all this rambling I feel like I'm doing right now, but out of anything, I just want you guys to take this away with you today. Maybe think about it throughout the rest of your week. But instead of allowing your problems, instead of allowing your enemy, the devil, to tell you how big he is, you need to look him dead in the eye and you need to start proclaiming, my God is bigger. You need to stop proclaiming, my God is bigger than you, Satan. And you need to start telling your problems how big your God is. I'm going to ask the worship team to go ahead and come on up. We're going to, we're going to close with this. Um, I know kind of stating the obvious here again, but Nehemiah, he couldn't have done any of this without God. He, he couldn't have taken a step out of the king's palace without God's favor without God's direction, without God's leadership. And here he is all of a sudden um, leading this team of people to build up the walls of Jerusalem that have been broken down for over a hundred years. And I think this is an amazing thing for us to, for all of us to take with us today because these three keys we went over about coming up with a plan and leading with vision and overcoming opposition by proclaiming how big your God is. Hey, all this is great. But without God in our lives, it's completely useless. Without God being the leader of our lives, it's completely useless. See, David David could have given up when he faced Goliath. He could have said, this is, this is too much for me. I, I'm, apparently, this guy's way bigger than me. I can't do this on my own. He could have given up. But instead, 
he found his confidence in his God. And Jesus could have given up when he was faced with a death sentence on the cross. But he didn't. Just like David, he had confidence in his God. He knew that God, his father, his great plan was to even sacrifice his only son. See, Jesus wasn't put on a cross. He wasn't placed on a cross against his will. He did it because he loved us. He chose to take that upon himself. And he could have given up at any moment, but instead he said, No, I know that my father needs me to do this. Not my will, but your will be done. He knew that this had to be done because it was through Jesus, the mediator, the guy that goes in between a holy God and a sinful man. Now we could approach God freely because the blood of Jesus washed away our sins. The blood of Jesus covered us and healed us of all of our sicknesses, of all of our diseases. And now we can have that ultimate relationship with God and have eternal life with him. Jesus knew that We needed him to let our light shine. And that's what we're talking about here. To being a city within our city to let our light shine, no matter what comes our way. When opposition arises, even if it's something as small as someone telling you, you can't say God bless as people walk out of your building, you're going to lose your job. Okay, fine. My dad has faced that. I've faced that. Never happened though. They just like to use threats. They like to use words. And if it does happen, God will provide. God will provide. Because you are doing exactly what you're supposed to be doing. The sacrifice of Christ is exactly why we're here this morning. We've been forgiven. You've been forgiven. You might say, Chris, no. (laughs) You don't know what I've done in my life. You don't know where I've been. No, you've been forgiven. The blood of Jesus forgives and washes away all of our sins. See, God is calling us today, each and every one of us, even those who, like myself, have been Christians and in church all of your life. God is calling us today to come out of darkness and into his marvelous light so that we can be those lights to shine into our city. He's calling us to be those people so that we can um, feel his love, feel his embrace, feel his blessings, feel his favor and his leadership in our lives so that we can then go out and share the same thing with other people. That's exactly what Nehemiah was expressing. And so today I want to make it available for you guys today that if you want to make God your leader of your life today like Nehemiah did, because again, he was a good leader. Nehemiah was a great leader because people followed him, but he couldn't have done that and people wouldn't have followed him necessarily if he didn't follow God. God was his leader, which made him a good leader. And so today... If you want, I want to make it an opportunity for you. If you want to ask God right now to be your leader, to come into your life and to forgive you of any sins that you have committed, he's he's willing and ready. He's out there right now with open arms, ready to just come in and love on you. And so I don't want to embarrass anybody. If you're here for the first time and you want to make this commitment with God, I just want to ask everyone to just um, close your eyes and bow your head. And we do this because we don't want to, we don't want to point fingers. We don't want to embarrass anybody. I want this to be a moment between you and God to where you can reach out to him and say, God, I need you. I want this to be the point for you to where you can say, God, I want to know you more. And I want to live my life for you in such a way that it brings a smile to your face so I can shine my light into my city, to shine your light that is inside me to my city, to be that one single light bulb to help expand the light in our city. And so today, we're going to all just pray this prayer together. Again, not to embarrass anybody. If you guys would just repeat after me. But the point of this prayer, there's no magic words in this. This isn't some amazing, um, holy relic of a prayer to pray. No. This is all between you and God right now. The sincerity in your heart. Praying this to a holy God. So let's all repeat after me. Heavenly Father. Thank you for being bigger than anything I could ever face. Thank you for your son, Jesus. I admit that I'm a sinner and that I need Jesus. I thank you and I receive your forgiveness. God, I thank you for the new life you've given me. And today I commit it back to you so I can let your light shine through me to my city. In 
Jesus' name. Amen. If you guys, if if you were in this place today and that was the first time you ever prayed anything like that, opening up your heart truly to God, the Bible says that there is a reason to celebrate because the Bible says that when one sinner comes to repentance out of a hundred saints, there's celebrating in heaven. There's celebration. The angels are rejoicing because you are now a new creation, the Bible says. Literally, the old you, the old nasty you is gone. All of those habits, it's behind you. The past is behind you and there's a new beginning in front of you but I want to encourage you that if this was your first time praying this this is not your final destination with God and your relationship with him this is your first step with him you can't just say oh well I prayed this prayer in church one day and God forgive me my sins and now I can go to heaven and live my life the way I want to that's not how it works it's a sincere prayer dedicating your life to God saying Lord I want you to be the Lord of my life and that word Lord literally means boss now you're saying God I want you to be the boss of my life you tell me not to listen to certain music because it has cursing in it okay god i'll do what you say you tell me not to uh, watch certain videos because they have explicit content in it okay god i'll do that you tell me to tell my co-workers that you love them that sounds kind of creepy but okay i'll do that for you and you're living your life for god that's what it means and so today we're going to worship with one more song and as we do i believe we have an awesome people serving as our prayer team this morning. If you guys don't mind standing up and holding your hand up really high, we got some awesome people right here. They love you and they love God. And if you did pray that prayer this morning for the first time, again, we're not going to embarrass you. You don't have to do this. But if you want to tell someone about that, if you want to get encouragement from these awesome people, I mean, they want to shake your hand. They want to hug your neck. They want to encourage you in the Lord and talk to you and, and help direct your steps to know exactly what to do next in your relationship with God. If if not, if, if you've been a Christian for all your life, like, like I said, I have, and you just prayed that prayer just out of a sincere heart to help those who are in here this morning not feel embarrassed, maybe now, during this worship song, maybe now this is the time that you need to swallow your pride. And like Nehemiah did, he went and he asked for help and support. Maybe this is your chance where you say, okay, this, this thing in my life right now is too big for me to do on my own. I need to ask someone to pray with me. I need to ask someone to help me in this by praying with me. This is your chance. This is your chance to come and ask for support in prayer because that's why our church is here, to bless you, to pray with you, and to encourage you in the Lord. So we're going to we're gonna worship God with one more song. And if you guys want to come and pray, you guys are more than welcome to. And then we'll close after this last song. Thank you for listening. For more audio and video resources, visit visionchurch.me.